I worked my art so viciously What they were now history Intoxicating victory Of a night that no one will ever see As I come back down to earth Burying the pieces of them in the dirt Human again with the munition to fake another day Amongst All my prey Hello old timers and newcomers I am Cole Scratches And thank you for joining me to take another look At what I found Somewhat sorry about the violent opening, but sometimes a man just needs to vent before he can act like a proper human being again. And by the end of this review, I hope to have made you understand why. Oh, that was so good. 2020 gifted many disasters. The nightmare scenario of the common cold turning deadly, social unrest in the world's largest nuclear arsenal, Venom 2 was postponed to 2021, and joining them all like a stone in the shoe of a leper was the flower tapes. Infamous and talked about, this ambitious first time feature written and directed by Sean Began and Bailey Erickson. In their own words, the Flower Tapes is a psychological found footage thriller about a heart-stricken man who copes with his spiraling life by creating a video diary, only to capture his own torment by the deranged sadists who have been spying on him. So yes, another passion project made by amateur filmmakers. And as always... <laughs> I was looking forward to it. Because found footage allows for even the most novice filmmaker to aspire for greatness with clever writing and direction. That's not to say it immediately allows for cinematic genius to bloom. <laughs> what you saw earlier was actually the end of the movie, cut up and edited into that little montage that I made, because, like I said, sometimes you need to start off on a positive. <laughs> this movie was a test to the standard I uphold for myself, to not belittle amateur filmmakers just because they're amateurs, to examine projects that are unique enough to be recognized to recognize their positives by admitting their negatives. And this movie... <laughs> it has positives! <laughs> and negatives. But to be fair, it's only really one negative that really bothers me. To be fair, the movie starts well enough. It's got some snazzy glitch effects and a title screen. Things that tell us whatever we're about to see we shouldn't take too seriously. Plus the heavy bass tone helps make it scary. And then we transition to the lovely main character, played by Sean Began. Hello, hello, Dr. Janet Wexler. It is me, your newest and probably most favorite patient, Kyle, coming at ya. He's calling his therapist to inform her he is making a sudden getaway to clear his head after his girlfriend just dumped him, instantly telling us three things. One, he is short-sighted and impulsive. Two, bit of a narcissist. Not only didn't he clear this little escapism with his doctor before he left, he's recording it, actually expecting her to watch it when he gets back. That's how high his opinion is of himself. And three, he's a vlogger. No adult speaks like this, unless they're deliberately trying to appeal to the tween demographic. Not unless they're a cunt. I know that's harsh, and he has done nothing to deserve it. I mean, breaking up with this girl, Carol, really messed him up. Just thinking about it has him leaking. He clearly needs time to process all of the pain he feels just to be reminded of her. Even I can relate with him to a degree, as he gets a message that the Airbnb, or... 
house BNB. I don't know what a house BNB is. I looked it up and I could only find Airbnb things. So anyway, the Airbnb he was supposed to be staying at has flooded. So he has been moved to a different place and he feels stressed about that, which I think is fair enough. I mean, when unforeseen things like that happen to me, that can knock me out for a day. So I definitely see where he's coming from with that. Um, also, if you don't know, because I didn't, Airbnb is a service that allows for complete strangers to lease out their properties as tourist housing. Which sounds just from the offset like how serial killers find their victims. Most of the journey, Kyle spends talking about his relationship and how Carol felt he wasn't a good enough boyfriend. And as he talks, his frustration is made evident by the tone of his voice. And it only grows when he arrives at the house and has to spend five minutes looking for the key. Credit where credit is due, Sean Began is a pretty good actor. Key uncovered, Kyle lets himself inside, gets up and offers the elsewhere located doctor a tour of the house for... reasons only known to Kyle. This thing is, it's a regular door, it's locked, so we don't know what that's about. We're gonna call that the mystery door, I guess. Why? Why are there eyes? Why are there eyes in the refrigerator? It's so weird. It's like I'm being watched. Foreshadowing. And looking at this blatant undertone, I dare say this movie has a comedic tint to it. Sean Began actually is an amateur comedian and stand-up, who his brand of humor mostly revolves around uh, being a bit awkward and making up for it by being a lad. And, uh, and a lot of his material is alright, however in this specific film... I am not doubling over with laughter. I get what's supposed to be funny and why. Having Kyle be oblivious to the fact he's in a horror movie is a neat joke to be in on. I don't know what these things are. They're kind of eerie looking. There's one in each room of the house, every room of the house. There's one by the mystery door, there's one by the front door. But I dare say the film's been a little bit boring up until this point. All Kyle has done is drive around and moan about how his relationship is over and the accommodations and now he's just walking about giving a tour that establishes all of nothing. I don't care! Give me something! Okay, got my attention again. This sudden presence skulking about the house is Sarah, played by Sarah Erickson. Interestingly, on IMDb, Sean Began is the only actor credited for this movie. Which tells me whoever wrote that article didn't bother to check the credits and figure out who played who. Or no other actor would want to be associated with this movie. Is it okay that I record you? You, you know, are you wanted for any crimes or anything? Ha 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 she is an obvious psycho and he asked her if she's committed any crimes. Ha <laughs> I hardly spoiled the film in saying that. She was introduced via jump scare and keeps swinging that hammer around like it's a rhombus. Plus, she introduces us to the hidden cameras, even if Kyle isn't aware of it. Pull it up a little on like, the left side. Got it. Looks good. Yep. Oh, most adorable serial killer ever! With the prop hung, Sarah leaves Kyle to his business. And I must say, Sean Began and Bailey Erickson really understand the spirit of found footage. See, in traditional filmmaking, there should be a dramatic rhythm and purpose to every scene. But found footage is supposed to imitate reality, and traditional doctrines may harm this ambition. Because real life doesn't follow a dramatic rhythm, and every moment doesn't serve a purpose. Heck, most moments don't serve a purpose. And they acknowledge this by having NOTHING HAPPEN FOR TWO MINUTES! I'm sorry, but that's like having dead air on a radio channel, you just don't do it. Also, when something does happen, it's the least interesting thing you could think of. Kyle finds Carol's toothbrush! And when I look at this toothbrush, I get angry because I think of all the places that we've been together. And now I'm alone. I'm alone with her fucking stupid toothbrush. Yet again, I do share his pain. I wouldn't want to be stuck with him either. Mm. I understand it's supposed to be laughable. It's ridiculous how worked up he gets over a toothbrush. But there is nothing for the humor to bounce off of. It's just him screaming about how unfair life is because he found his girlfriend's toothbrush. He's in pain. He's miserable. He uses his anger as a shield against the hurt. And all I... All I want to do 
is burst through the door, put my hand on his shoulder and say, Dude, I need to tell you something. And you're not going to want to hear it. I don't even want to say it because I don't want to be sexist, but it needs to be said. Grow up hair! And with this cane shoved in his spokes, Kyle descends into drunken misery for the rest of the night. He's lost, he's lonely, he doesn't realize he just caught a half-finished prop above his head, and he falls over, making sure his face is in focus, before falling asleep. Oh yay! I was getting tired of this guy! Outside the scene, two femme fatales manifest to end Kyle's reservation. Playfully, they prod and poke at the soon-to-be corpse, quite literally putting him under their heel. And then... he wakes up the next morning. Cock thesis! I have no idea why they did that. They got ready to kill him and then stopped. They may as well not have done it at all. Kyle wakes up and he deals with last night's escapades the way any sensible drunk does and completely dismisses them. When I got drunk for the first time, I took out my trash bin and put it in the middle of my kitchen floor. You do weird shit when you're drunk. I don't really question him not being too bothered by finding his door open. What I do question is the camera. It kept recording through the night. What storage does it have? What kind of batteries? And where can I get one? Last night, Kyle announced he wanted to surf. But after having to move something to get the surfboards, he decides he doesn't want to surf. Funny. So instead he goes on a rant about how creepy suburbs are. And there's something really eerie to me about the suburbs. Because I feel like if something bad happens in the city, it happens out in the open, everyone can see it, you know? But if something happens in the suburbs, it happens behind closed doors. That makes no sense. The reason bad things happen behind closed doors is because it's people doing bad things. Why would people start doing bad things out in the open as soon as they move to the city? Also, I have sampled living in the city, in the suburbs, and out in the country. I'd argue the city is the creepiest. Because even if bad things happen behind closed doors and they suddenly come out in the city, nobody cares! Unless it's their immediate neighbors, and even then, their only concern is the property value. Writing Carol's name in the sand, and watching the waves wash it away, is a technique Dr. Wexler told them about for dealing with what are now painful memories. And having done that, he decides to preemptively bury his head in the sand. I made a decision today that I will um, not be reviewing the footage that I shoot. Uh, I, I made this decision because... If you did, you might do something interesting, like react to the threat and choose to flee or fight. Because it's embarrassing. And if that's the attitude you approach this with, maybe I shouldn't be making this video! Also, my dear audience, something you may have noticed. I have not criticized the plot of this movie. That's because there isn't one. There's no conflict to drive the story forwards, there's no foil for Kyle to overcome. The entire movie is him just venting his frustration about his relationship with Carol. Now, to be fair, to be fair, it is possible to make that interesting. An entire movie about self-reflection and overcoming one's inner demons actually sounds interesting. The issue is this movie doesn't do that. The entire film is just Kyle moaning and wailing about how much he loves, hates, and misses Carol, and guess what? It's fucking boring. I don't care about their relationship, because I don't learn anything about the relationship other than Carol wanted to leave him, and honestly, I don't blame her, because the man is a piece of shit who I literally Literally couldn't wait to see you die, so get your running shoes because we are going for a marathon. In the evening, Kyle gets a call from Dustin or Justin, played by Joshua Geller or Bailey Erickson, the credits aren't very clear on that, who tells Kyle he saw Carol with a guy at their old hangout. This has the predictable effect of sending Kyle down another rabbit hole of bitterness. Our bar. And that's kind of messed up because I feel like an asshole. We're gonna have some character growth? 
he's gonna recognize that feeling angry about his girlfriend moving on from him is petty and he feels ashamed of himself? Because I left the apartment thinking I would give her time and space to pack up. Not to fucking take dudes to our bar. Nope. Instead, he drowns his sorrows in an ocean of beer, but it must have been non-alcoholic because he wakes up to strange noises outside his window that are very clearly someone walking around the gravel. And instead of calling the police, he goes outside to investigate, leading to the most horrid event of the movie. Not only doesn't he get a surprise axe to the spine, Sarah has become a zombie! Okay, I don't know why the shed is open and I don't know what made that noise. All that I do know is that I'm exhausted and I'm going inside. She was upbeat, she was fun, she was playful. Now look at her, she's... She was the best thing of the movie. In the morning, Sarah walks out of the mystery door and leaves me wondering how Kyle didn't notice the light shining through the cracks and plays around with Kyle's camera for a bit. Sure is convenient Kyle established he wasn't gonna review the footage earlier. But he wakes up, not to notice Sarah skulking about, but to review the sound from last night. My instinct was, oh my god, it's a human. There's somebody outside this room. And upon walking through these rocks now, I feel like it was probably a big animal. Fucking die. Narcissistic, annoying, and dumb. Kyle's death remains absent, as he instead takes a stroll through the forest that he may find a place to cuss out his ex. She's a fucking bitch! Fuck Carol! I was the best fucking boyfriend she ever had, so I don't know what- Hey, whoa. Hi. What are you doing? I'm- Seeing him humiliate himself did make me feel better, so thank you, Began and Erickson. He asks for Sarah's help to find a river, and when he finds it, he backtalks Sarah, before going home, and none of this went anywhere. Aren't you glad you're on this journey with me? Back home, Sarah leaves her room again and sneaks about, being creepy but not actually doing anything. And then we take a moment for Kyle to recognize drowning his feelings in alcohol is a bad coping mechanism, but he's gonna keep doing it. I'm using it to help me forget about Carol, and I know that there are probably healthier ways to do that. It hurts every time I hear that she isn't in as much pain as I'm in, so I am choosing to drink more than I usually do. I'm gonna choose to not be sad. So he realizes his drinking is a bad way of coping with things, but he does it anyway, and because he recognizes it's bad, that makes it healthy. That's as if I would stuff myself with comfort food, knowing that's a bad way of coping with being sad, but doing it anyway and expecting not to be fat. It's none of your business whether or not I do that! But he is just gonna have one cup of rosé, so it should be good. Some hours later, he's out drunk a whale, whining about how much he misses Carol. And then... Someone's calling me. But I don't know the number. So I'm not gonna answer it. Instead, I'm just gonna sit here in the dark and drink more. Because I'm lonely. Dr. Wexler, I'm lonely, and I'm sad, and I'm fucking miserable, and I think that's what Carol wants, so fuck her, and fuck whoever she's with. <laughs> you know what's funny about this scene? That was Carol calling him. <laughs> he didn't recognize her number, so... While he sits here spewing bile over her, presumably she worries about this waste of dog food. <laughs> and later on, he calls her back. <laughs> and instead of acting like a human being, he vomits vitriol into the phone about how much he hates her. <laughs> I just wish that I really said what was on my mind instead of saying what I think people wanted to fucking hear. When have you not? You know what? Forget the marathon, we are going for a sprint. Yesterday he was gonna drink all week to deal with the pain. Today he's gonna stop drinking entirely. Hehehe, <laughs> isn't he random? Emphasis on dumb. Because he's woken up at 7.30 in the morning by Sarah chopping up something. 
Never mind the fact most people are already at work or on their way around this time in the morning, she still woke him up and he's annoyed. Oh, also... If anyone sees you in the woods again, you should definitely smile more, alright? Cucked asshole! And if you thought we'd peaked in douchebaggery, when he calls Carol back, he yells at her about why he would want to call when she dumped him, and if something horrible happened to him, he wouldn't want anyone calling her about it. Angry, hurt, pathetic, he decides the best way to get over Carol is with another woman. So he invites Sarah over for dinner. And as if this entire situation couldn't get any stranger, she says yes! What surreal reality have I entered? Anyway, he says he'll cook, which he doesn't, and then whines to himself about how he doesn't know what he wants out of tonight and maybe he'll get back together with Carol, as if it's an option, and proceed to have a terrifically awkward date where he empties several bottles to himself while bitching about Carol to Sarah. I just turn him on whenever something interesting happens. FUCKING LIAR! Meanwhile, Sarah is an absolute delight next to this walking rot, but because they weren't entirely on the same wavelength, as soon as she's out the door... So hot. So hot, but kind of a bitch. And after a bit more whining into the camera about how much he misses Carol and he should drive up to see her, Kyle finally passes out and we are at the stage of the movie. I've been waiting for the past 75 minutes to arrive. Joy! Oh joy. The boar laid out, marinated for the feast, the flower girls enter and take their positions. One with the camera, the other with the hammer, and veiled by the obscene amounts of alcohol, they set to work. No, I'm not gonna critique the awful sound effect, I'm just happy we're finally here! The alcohol ebbs and thins, leaving a dried out, broken man to face the blazing pain shooting up his leg, like the teeth of a pit bull tearing at his ruptured foot. Kyle wakes to find his limb bruised and shattered, torturously disassembled in the haze of alcohol, and he asks, just what happened last night? This complicates my review. Okay, okay, calm down. This is bringing a smile to my face, but for Christ's sakes, don't milk it. What is that crunching? Is he actually walking on his foot? Fuck! Fuck! I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be here. And now you know how I feel, you piece of shit. In this state, thoughts aren't coming clearly. Hungover, pained and panicking, and short-sighted even now, he makes it no further than the hall before he veers from the path to the door to wobble over to the dark bathroom. Perhaps something about this echoey room reminds him of a confessional, or maybe the utter helplessness affects him, or maybe a distant memory of the Blair Witch Project influences him, but he voices his regrets into the camera. I know that I'm the asshole of the story. You should have done me a long time ago. I didn't appreciate you, and I just wish that you were here right now to take care of me. Repenting only when you're desperate. <laughs> yes. Beg, you insect. With his heart lightened, he stands up again, wailing in pain as he attempts to stand on his ruined foot, hobbling his way into the living room, only to be met by the banes of his existence. Even in his execution, he's shown more leniency than he deserves, as he wakes up alive, gagged, and further hobbled than even Paul Sheldon. Okay, wow. I mean, it's not as impressive as, say, Capture Kill Release, but it's really impressive considering the budget. Just... More blood, please. Crippled and broken, panic drives Kyle through the pain. He crawls across the floor, ripping and wrinkling the plastic put out for him. Ignoring the clear truth that there is no escaping this, he still tries, struggling to reach the door. A thousand and one movies you need to see before you die. Is that supposed to be a hint? Yes! Fantastic!
Thank you! What? They bury the camera? Why? They have cameras all over the house and how was the footage from those cameras edited into this camera if they didn't keep the camera and who edited the footage at all? Uh, that was the flower tapes. Fuck! Individually, the building blocks of this film aren't bad. A small number of characters give room to truly get to know them and invest you in their fate. Making the characters obnoxious or otherwise deserving of their fate is an essential part of slasher movies or revenge flicks. Hell, having the main character be a complete shithead doesn't have to be something bad if they're charming or funny. Or it can make their eventual fate all the more satisfying to wait for. But that is a big if. Yes, the guy was thoroughly unlikable, and yes, I was looking forward to seeing him die, but not only did the movie take too long to get there, with too little going on in the meantime, I was still stuck getting to know this piece of excrement for almost 80 minutes, and his eventual fate was not worth the wait. I would have nailed his limbs to a table and opened him up with a Y incision so I could individually fondle his organs. I would have snipped off his finger, knuckle by knuckle, and fed them to him, so I could sit back and watch his stomach digest them. I would have individually broken each one of his ribs, so I could reach in and squeeze his heart. And finally, with a firm grip on each lung, I would have choked him to death! And rather than take that as a sign that I may need to be committed, contemplate that when Began and Ericsson wrote this character, maybe they took things too far. But don't confuse Began for Kyle. Began actually does a good job portraying him. It takes talent to make a character this unbearable. It doesn't just happen by accident. They knew what they were doing, and the writing reminded me a lot of Rob Zombie movies. Except it was just the one asshole, rather than the whole cast and crew. Another thing I will acknowledge is, Began and Ericsson didn't sanitize anything. The film is an ugly roller coaster between sadness, anger, bitterness and misery. Kudos to them for recognizing the end of a relationship isn't always pretty, and they provided a deep dive into Kyle's shallow psychology. None of this changes the fact he's an odorous leftover of Two Girls One Cup who if you find him funny, fucking good on you, but I can't stand this abortion. I won't say he's very deep or convoluted. At times I felt like they looked up lists of social do's or don'ts, and then did all of the don'ts when writing this character. But there was something very visceral about the way he behaved. On occasion I even found things that I dislike about myself that I disliked in him, which made me hate him even more. But there was nothing positive to balance all of the negative. Let's move on before I vomit in frustration. <sighs> I feel like I've run a thousand yards. If the point of the character was to be unlikable, they succeeded beyond expectation. By contrast, I think the story is the film's weakness. There was no plot, no conflict, only the barest hint of a free act structure, and very little led logically into anything else. Things just kind of happened, pretty much based on the mood of the main character, and whatever was needed to stretch it into a feature-length runtime. They can write characters, and understood that real life doesn't come down to tropes and cliches, but there was no sense of pacing or excitement about the events unfolding. And the ending? Really disappointing. It was fun to see the punctured leech squirm around, but to then have the characters just bury the camera with him as it was still rolling? I expected the film to lead up to a conspiracy arranged by Carol to have the bastard killed or something along those lines, but no, camera is just buried, still recording, clearly showing the girls' faces, with no explanation for how the footage came back or who edited it. Finally, I want to talk about the reason for filming it at all. To make a video diary specifically for his therapist is already pretty thin, but I think it plays into what kind of character he is. 
I have no problem imagining this self-centered bung is deluded enough to think his therapist's whole world revolves around him and his well-being. I can imagine him thinking they just make time to watch him live his life. But conversely, I have trouble seeing this guy in therapy. I'd say he needs it, but the issue is his narcissistic personality disorder, not his lack of a heartbreak. It would have made much more sense to me for the guy to be a vlogger filming his life for attention to fuel his ego. Add on to that the murderous women having already filled the entire house with cameras, it just gets ridiculously contrived. It hurts me to say, but the flower tapes is bad. It's not even enjoyably bad, it's just bad. But that's not to say I don't think it has an audience, or the creators should just give up. I think the individual parts they had were done well enough, but the way it was all put together just didn't work. And I sentenced this movie to a 2 on a scale of 11. Which may just about be the lowest score I have ever given a movie. But even this movie isn't bad enough for a 1. And I can feel the intent, I can feel the passion, misguided as it may have been. And I don't want to discourage these guys from making more movies in the future, just... If you're watching, please look at this film as a learning experience and... An instruction of things not to try again. Or maybe I'm completely wrong and history will prove it. Thank you all for watching, I have been Core Scratches, this has been Lucas who has his claws in my arm and I can't move him. Uh, he probably vanished for a moment there, but never mind. Make sure to follow my art channel, my DA, my Twitter, like, comment, subscribe, subscribe, tell a friend and I hope you will see me again next time where hopefully I can do this in more than one take.